This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk about the power of human relationships and the power of the individual. This is something that we don't hear discussed in our culture and in our media at all. We're told from childhood that we need to surrender ourselves or give up our individuality to become part of something, whatever it is, some kind of group, some kind of organization. In today's society, they don't come out and call it the collective, but the the Marxist thinking that is embedded in our educational process from kindergarten all the way through a PhD level, the idea that every individual no longer has a right to their individuality, but they have to merge into kind of a collective group think. Nobody's allowed to think independently and individually. They have to become part of group think or they're going to get punished or rejected or worse. Our entire society is built on this. And yet, the foundations upon which our society, in which our nation, in which our culture, and sadly to say, our churches are built on, are the exact opposite foundations and ideas that God created his people to build their lives on. In other words, one of the first things you discover in the Word of God, in the book of Genesis, one of the first things you discover is that the True God, and a lot of people talk about all kinds of gods, but they don't really know what they're talking about. Therefore, their perceptions and writings about their so-called gods are always mystical, or they're vague, or they're unclear, or they're ambiguous. Why? Because they don't know God. Yet, when you read the Word of God and you walk in a supernatural relationship with God, you, you get to know God. See, it's possible to know God while you're alive. It's impossible to walk with God. And when you know God and you walk with God and you know God's word, you have an intimacy, a friendship with God. And so the word religion doesn't even enter your mind. That's why it, it bothers me a great deal when Christians are seduced into defining the relationship, their supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ. They allowed they allow the secular culture to define it for them. And the, the secular culture defines Christianity as a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's never been a religion. The only time Christianity is a religion is when it's completely misunderstood. And I want to say that again because it's really important. No Christian should define their belief system or their relationship with God as a religion or a religious experience. That's to degrade it. That's to debase it. That's to make it far lower than what it is. Why is it that we allow people who are atheists and agnostics or people who are dead set in their beliefs and they're dedicated to destroying Christianity for a number of reasons, why do we allow them to define what our relationship with God is all about? You see, the very the very notion of taking the supernatural relationship of Billions of people throughout human history, billions of people have had a supernatural relationship with what the Bible calls the infinite personal living God of the universe. They prayed to him. They talked to him. They listened to him. They allowed him to compose music through them. They wrote poetry and paintings inspired by by him. They danced like David danced and David (coughs) shocked his his wife. His wife hated him because David danced openly in victory 
Now, David wasn't a nut. Let's, 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 let's make this very clear. There are some people who behave like nuts. Nobody respects them. They're, they're ostracized. I'm not talking about acting like a nut. See, David had earned the right to dance before the people of Israel because God worked such miraculous military victories through him that he earned the right. He earned the right by taking care of business in the physical realm. He earned the right to dance openly before the Lord. And he did that. And he didn't wear a whole lot of clothing. He wasn't being obscene. He was not being sexually suggestive. That we can be assured of, because that would have not been in David's total character. David would not have danced before the people of Israel in, in, a, in a way that would have uh, been sexually suggestive. But he did dance in his linen ephod, which is probably the equivalent of a pair of short, short, short shorts, athletic shorts, something along those lines. And his, his wife, Michal, who was the daughter of Saul, uh, despised him for doing this. But you know why she really despised him? You know why she really despised her husband, David? Because as she was peering out the window and watching her husband dance um, unabashedly with joy before the people, she despised him for that. And why did she despise him? Because he was dancing? No. She despised him because she could sense that her husband David had been set free by the power of God. He was no longer bound by religious tradition and the expectations of others. He was free. The Spirit of God had done such a powerful work in his life that he was free from what what some people call a religious spirit. He was free from this religious spirit, and he, he worshiped God by openly dancing before the Lord in victory. Not, again, nothing sexually suggestive in his dancing. And that was the root reason Michal, or Michael, hated, hated David. And if you dig deeper into the story, you discover the real reason. And this reason plays out in your life and my life, and we need to be aware of it. Whenever God moves on a person legitimately, whenever God moves through a person legitimately, there are two or three kinds of responses. Those people who genuinely have a personal relationship with God and love God. When they see somebody that God is moving through or upon, they rejoice because they're one in the spirit with that man or woman. And so they rejoice with them and they share in the passion and the enthusiasm because their hearts are right with the Lord. But then you have, let's call them the fakers. The fakers are those people who are outwardly religious, they outwardly put on a show of being religious, but inwardly they, they live totally in the flesh. Inwardly, the Spirit of God does not control or fill them. They are ruled by their flesh, and the flesh is in rebellion against God. So, so they're like dead men walking now, outwardly, they, they can put on a great show of religious piety, but inwardly, they're like dead men's bones, and they despise the true things of God. Now, let's go back to uh, Michael's father. Michael's father was the Saul, the king of Israel. He was a tall, handsome man, and he had all the attributes of what marketing experts would call a successful politician. He was tall, he was handsome, he was eloquent. In every sense of the word, in the flesh, he had what it took to be a leader of men. But there was one problem. And the problem was that he did not have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, upon his leadership. 
Therefore, even though he was above average in, in all kinds of skills and abilities that men have, he was not anointed by the Holy Spirit for leadership. And therefore, when you read David's life, he continually makes compromises. He continually retreats. He's continually jealous of those people that are genuinely anointed. That's why he was jealous constantly of David, because King Saul could sense that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was genuinely upon David's life, and that God had supernaturally called David to leadership, and David was anointed to be king over Israel, whereas uh, Saul was king of Israel, but he wasn't anointed to be king of Israel. There was no anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him in the sense of, um, in, in comparison with David. So Michael, who is the daughter of Saul, she was kind of the same spirit that Saul was. And she was of the flesh. She had not been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in her perception, in her inner universe, <clears throat> everything was a calculated move towards power and acceptance. And she was not free. She, you will find that people, people who pretend to be religious leaders or Christian leaders or, or who pretend to have uh, a calling or a gifting uh, from God, Christians, you will find that those in the Christian community that are pretenders, they secretly despise those people who are anointed by the Holy Spirit, even though um, large numbers of people may, may, may gather around some of these leaders who have a reputation for uh, being uh, great Bible teachers and great ministers and so on and so forth, it's not enough for them. You see, they may have many people who follow them. They may, they, they may know how to teach the Word of God. They may do a lot of good. But it's not enough for them because they're, they're secretly ruled by the flesh and not the Spirit. Now, none of us can claim to be totally ruled by the, the Spirit. God in each one of our lives is bringing us to places of conviction of sin where he demands that we repent and die to the flesh and by faith allow Christ to resurrect our new nature. So none of us is perfect. None of us is holier than thou. But we need to be very careful that we don't do what Michael was doing. She, see, see, she allowed her flesh to turn into hatred. She truly hated her husband. Why? Because he was free in the spirit. And you will find over and over again, that when a man or a woman is truly anointed by the Holy Spirit, truly being used by God and called by God, that often religious leaders who outwardly appear to have all kinds of spiritual and biblical authority, um, they will be the very ones that will try to tear down, attack and in some cases, crucify the man or woman God has called. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of this. Jesus Christ was, king, not was, is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yet the religious establishment of, of his day, the Pharisees, now remember, Jesus was coming to a Jewish culture, but the spirit of a Pharisee is not exclusive to Jews. The spirit of the Pharisee is alive and well in evangelical Christian circles. And the spirit of the Pharisee um, was blinded by their flesh, blinded by their illegitimate authority. They could not recognize who Christ was because they were serving the flesh. They really weren't serving the God of Israel. That was all a big pretense so that they could have money, power, and control so they pretended to be men of great piety. They pretended to be men of deep spirituality when, when in fact it was just an act that inside they were like ravenous wolves. And that proved to be the case because when they finally cornered and manipulated 
the events surrounding Jesus Christ. They had the Romans crucify Christ on a cross, despite the fact that Pilate was willing to let Christ go free. And then they crucified him, the Pharisees, and they made sure he was put to death because they were terrified of the freedom that his life represented. You see, Christ's life was an expression of the true God. Christ's life was a manifestation of the Spirit of God. Christ's life brought unmerited favor, grace. Christ's life brought salvation by faith. Christ's life brought the light of the world into the dark world. They hated that. So oftentimes you'll see that when the Spirit of God is moving powerfully, not all the time, but many times you'll see that when the Spirit of God is moving powerfully in individuals or groups or nations, <clears throat> that those in, in groups that call themselves Christians or call themselves God's people are among the most jealous and murderous and vengeful, and they will do anything to stop the individual that God is using. Why? because they are in rebellion from God themselves. They are, um, they are committing the same sin that Satan has committed. They want to be God. They're in rebellion from God. And they're dead men. They have never come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They have never put their faith in Christ. Therefore, they're serving their flesh, which is doomed to judgment, and they're rebelling, and they, they uh, castigate and fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ, which sets men free. This is a very, very important thing to understand, because on one hand, we have people who have a genuine, living, vibrant, passionate, supernatural relationship with the personal living God of the universe, and on the other hand, we have people who are spiritually dead, who are serving Satan, but outwardly, like they wear masks, out, outwardly they pretend to be people of great piety and spirituality, but they are at war against the truth and the life found in Jesus Christ. And we need to be discerning. You see, you just don't look at someone's external resume. You just don't look at someone's external accomplishment list you observe whether or not that individual has a real, vibrant relationship with Christ. Is the fruit of the Spirit really uh, being born in their life? Are they, do they have an intimacy with God? Are they walking with the God of the Bible? This is what we need to, 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 to look after, and we need to be zealous to do it. Now, Adam and Eve, they walked in the Garden of Eden. And there is so much truth in Genesis about the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God and had with each other. And when we understand the relationship that Adam and Eve had with each other and had with God, we understand just how fantastic, just how awesome it is to have a supernatural and personal relationship with the living God. So let's remember God's basic plan. He created earth. He created the world as it's recorded in the book of Genesis. He is a creator God. And unlike Satan and unlike satanic systems, and this is something that, that most Christians don't understand, most Christian leaders don't understand, and it could very well cost them everything if they don't understand this powerful truth. The Bible teaches the importance of individualism. Individualism is under attack in our culture. Individualism is called evil. But individualism is biblical. Individualism is a reflection of the identity that God gave each one of us as individuals when he created us. This popular idea that does not come from the Bible, by the way, this popular idea that we need to get rid of our individualism and move into being one uh, sounds spiritual, but it's death. 
this uh, idea that we need to merge together in groupthink, become part of a world brain, um, um, and other such things, or, or become part of the collective, which comes from Marxist communist teaching, which vehemently does not believe in Christian principles and vehemently does not believe in the God of the Bible. Communism and Marxism, which, by the way, is the invention of the globalist elite and the super wealthy capitalists, their game plan is to destroy all individuality and cause people to merge into a mass mind, a collective, an all-powerful state where the individual no longer matters. In fact, they go so far as to say the individual must be killed and destroyed because the individual is an enemy to the state. Another term for that is the hive mind, that everybody slavishly gives over their gives over their identity like some kind of worker bee to the mother bee, which is the hive mind. But what is being concealed from them, because remember, we're doing we're dealing with two different systems of thought. One system of thought is coming from God's Word and the infinite personal living God of the universe, who's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. That, when we get ideas from that source, those ideas are truthful. When we get our ideas from the other source, which is Satan, Satan is the father of lies, they're lies. Truth sets you free, lies put you in bondage. So we're talking about two fundamentally different worldviews upon which you and I will build our lives, upon which you and I, our children, will build their lives, our grandchildren will build their lives, our nation, our cities, our families will all build their lives based upon one of two um, foundations. One is a false foundation and one is a true foundation. The pressure is on through the mass media, through the uh, educational system, through scientific mind control, through government, through music, through television, um, and even religion. The, the, the pressure is on to, to force people to surrender their individuality and, and become part of a group mind or a hive mind and, and give up their God-given individuality. But you see, when you read the Bible and when you understand history, and this is why it is so dangerous, you know, you have friends, I have friends. They choose to be very shallow Christians. And shallow is a polite word for deceived and ignorant Christians, when they begin believing uh, ideas that are, that are poisonous, they put themselves and their children's lives in jeopardy. Remember, ideas are important. Ideas have consequences. Good ideas have good consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. So this idea that um, individuality doesn't matter and we should all merge into a group mind and group think, and again, individually doesn't, individuality doesn't matter, will become part of a hive mind or a world brain um, or a slave state or the state is all powerful. You see, superficially, to people that are uneducated, to people that are easily manipulated and fooled, to people that only can think superficially, to people who do not have any knowledge of history, to people who don't have any knowledge of historical facts, to people that are ignorant, the, this idea that we should all give up our individuality, individuality and become a group mind that sounds very appealing, superficially. If you don't know the facts, and you don't know what you're talking about, and you don't know the outcomes in history, then you're going to be seduced into 
uh, uh, believing this group mind, hive mind idea, and you're going to look at that, look at it falsely and under tremendous spiritual deception as something that is good for mankind, when in fact that kind of thinking, that kind of social organizational structure always brings about with it, always, without exception. If you know history, you know that there's always the same result, there's always the same end game when we enter a, a political environment where the individual no longer counts, it's just groupthink. What always happens next, with mathematical certainty, is you will have a dictatorship, a totalitarian state, in which all the people are convinced to talk, think, act the same through propaganda, through mind control, through the media, through the press, through radio, television, film, and now today we have the internet and social media technology. But in inevitably, 100% of the time, this always produces a state of total slavery and a total loss of freedom. That is the historical model. Nobody, can, nobody has to guess about it. They just have to have some understanding of history because history points out the results of that kind of thinking. And it's very, very dangerous. Now, the other thing that you have to understand is there is a spiritual dynamic beneath it all that's very, very powerful. To the degree that you understand the spiritual dynamic underneath all this and how powerful it is, to the degree that you comprehend that is to the degree that you will be a person of power and you will be a person of freedom and you will have the power to spread freedom and not slavery. So it's essential, absolutely essential, that you understand the spiritual forces that are uh, happening underneath this, this global conflict. It's essential that you understand the power of individuality versus the destructive nature of the uh, group mind or hive mind or world brain. It is imperative that you really understand this and just don't act like a, you know, a dumb cow following all the other cows with a, with a, with a bell uh, tied around your neck. If you love your neighbor as yourself, if you love your children, you love your grandchildren, if you say you love Jesus Christ, then you have a higher obligation to pay the price and learn how to think and gain the knowledge that you need to not only protect your life, but to protect the lives of millions of innocent children and people all over planet Earth. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is a very important message. You won't hear this message in the media ever. They always promote in the undercurrent group think, the hive mind, the world brain, the collective. Oh, they don't come out and say exactly what it is, but they're always promoting those ideas, and those are very dangerous and destructive ideas. We need to, while we still have the uh, availability to do so, we need to promote the truth as fast as we can and as far as we can so that the truth of God's word regarding the truth of Jesus Christ can be spread throughout all the earth. That's where you and I uh, come into play. But truth has to be communicated. It has to be spread and truth sets men and women free. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. You can send an archive of this very program uh, on the Paul McGuire Report to people all over the world just choosing a social media icon. And through all kinds of social media, you can send this program and you can open up their minds, their hearts, and their, uh, their consciousness to the truth and change their lives. Okay, in, in a minute, I want to talk about why is it that there's an invisible force at work in the world that is very, very much behind making sure 
that everybody goes into this groupthink mode, that everybody stops being an individual and goes into the hive mind or the world brain. What is the purpose of that? What is the end game for that? Because there is an end game for that. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. We're able to, to send this message around the world, by the way, because of people like you who are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And out of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you talk to the Lord, you pray to the Lord. And when the Lord tells you to do something, you do it. Not because of religious reasons, but because you're in a personal relationship with the Lord. So I want to thank those of you that obey the Lord and choose to pray for me, my family, and this ministry, that we can continue to present and communicate the truth. And I want to thank those of you that listen to the Lord, because you too are walking in a creative, dynamic, supernatural relationship with the Lord, and he gives you ideas on how to do end runs around censorship, and you help us do an end run around censorship. And then I want to thank those of you that are faithful contributors, and you make donations to this ministry, and you too have a relationship with God. And whatever the Lord tells you to do, you do. And so you act based on your, you, you act and give and donate financially on the basis of your supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ. In the same way that I do this program and run this ministry based on a supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into this individuality thing, I want to I want to go back and do a quick revisit of how important it is to be an individual and to have your own individual relationship with Jesus Christ versus just having some kind of religious relationship with Jesus Christ, which is non which is non personal and non authentic. By the way, this is the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Okay, let's go back to David's life. Now, David is the only man in the Bible, the only man in the entire Bible who God says is a man after his own heart. And yet David murdered somebody, he lied, and he committed adultery. Now, committing adultery is not something God approves of. Lying is not something God approves of. And killing a man is not something God approves of. And David paid a heavy penalty for this in his own personal life and in the, the traumatic problems he had with his own sons. Uh, God forgave David, but he paid <clears throat> an unbelievably painful price down here on earth. Yet God continued to call him uh, a man after my own heart. And he's the only man that God ever gave the label to, that David is, is a man, the only man after God's heart. So there was something in David's intimate relationship with the Lord. In other words, they had a closeness. They had a relationship. They had a vibrant relationship that was real. It wasn't religious. David obviously communicated to the Lord on a deep level, and he allowed the Lord to communicate to him on a deep level. David was not superficially communicating to the Lord, nor was he faking it. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who know all about Jesus Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. So God is underscoring here what he wants, what he desires. What is it that God desires? God desires a deep, intimate, passionate relationship with each one of us, each one of us people. And how does that happen? Well, I can tell you some of the ways it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen through faking it. It doesn't happen through being religious. It doesn't happen by going on autopilot. 
you see, oh, there's a lot of people who think that they're great Christians because they know Bible verses, they've memorized Bible verses, they, they know the Bible, etc. But they don't know, they don't have a depth in their relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't know Jesus Christ. And that is the most important thing of all. When Jesus Christ died for our sins, the verse that you're all familiar with, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God was saying how much he loved every man or woman, and that it, it was his desire, God's desire, that they would believe in him so that they wouldn't perish and have everlasting life. And that's open to everyone. So we know from that passage of Scripture and many others, that God is love and the depth of God's love towards each of us is absolutely amazing. But again, you know, there's a lot of people, and I don't fault them for this. This is what they like. I mean, there's a huge percentage of people that like this. Probably many of you like this. I'm not criticizing you for liking it. But there's a lot of people who love to go into uh, architecturally magnificent church structures, especially church structures built, you know, hundreds of years ago. And, and you find great inspiration in those church structures. Well, I think that's fine. It's not really my cup of tea, but it's, it's fine. But I, I, I wouldn't fault anybody for uh, finding God's presence in the beauty of those architectural structures but I, but I would question, um, not judge, but question where you do find a deep and intimate personal relationship with God. Because one of the first things that I realized is somebody who was deeply involved in the New Age movement. And remember, in the New Age movement, in Eastern mysticism, all of which I was involved in, the goal was to become one with the universe. The goal was to achieve cosmic consciousness. The goal of, the, of, of Eastern mysticism was to die to yourself and <clears throat> become one with cosmic consciousness, etc. But, you know, all of that troubled me because in the process of those pursuits, I would ultimately die as an individual, and I would just become one with the universe. Now, that really didn't sound exciting to me at all. It sounded depersonal. It sounded, it sounded like, oh, okay, so once I'm enlightened, I just, uh, you know, I, my personality gets burned up. Uh, I achieve, literally, these are the words that the Eastern mystics use. I achieve perfect nothingness. That's a goal. That's a spiritual goal, is to achieve perfect nothingness. Well, perfect nothingness doesn't sound like heaven to me. I noticed that when I was reading about the God of the Bible, he was completely different than the God of the New Age, the God of altered states of consciousness, the God of um, Eastern mysticism, because the God of all those occult viewpoints was mystical. He was non-personal. He was an energy force. He wasn't a person. He didn't have personal interactions. And all the people who were the mystics and the gurus and leaders in those spiritual movements were all talking about this non-personal seeing the great white light, which I saw the great white light. I became one with the universe. I had these powerful experiences, but they were not satisfying. And the reason they weren't satisfying is they were an experience. I wasn't getting to know the person of God. I was just having an experience. And there's a big difference between having an experience and knowing God intimately and personally. And what we learn from John 3.16 is that God has an incredible desire to know you intimately and personally, and every man and woman intimately and personally. Now, when we read the story of Adam and Eve, God supernaturally... First of all, he designed the Garden of Eden intimately and personally for Adam and Eve. So it was a garden of unbe unbelievable beauty 
and tranquility, as nature always is. And God designed the Garden of Eden personally, and God built and created the Garden of Eden personally because he knew personally Adam and Eve. He knew what Adam and Eve would like, and he went out and built them a Garden of Eden or paradise to live in, which was built on what he knew Adam and Eve would be blessed by because he knew them personally. He wasn't just some abstract mystical force. And so the garden was beautiful and they enjoyed it. And notice also, this comes out of God being the infinite personal living God of the universe. God is a person, not just an abstract energy force. We read the story of Adam, okay, in Genesis 1. And we notice that God creates Adam, but we notice that that um, God, because he knows Adam personally, God observes that Adam is lonely, even though he has a relationship with God, that God, that Adam needs a companion. And so God creates out of his personal love and knowledge of Adam, God creates a a companion for Adam, who is Eve. And she is a woman made out of man. And this is a very beautiful uh, expression from God. It's very personal, it's very deep, and it's very intimate the first man and the first woman. So we read in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So notice that God, because he knew man personally, made every tree grow that is pleasant and good for food, except for one, which he forbid uh, Adam and Eve to eat. And then... Because Adam had a personal knowledge of Adam, he notices that Adam is alone, lonely. And so he says in verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Okay, so Adam is naming all the names of the animals. But prior to that, God observes, because he's a personal God, that it is not good for a man to be alone, and that I will make a helper comparable to him. So in verse 20, uh, verse 20, So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, And he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So there's a tremendous truth here. The truth is that the God of the Bible is not just this cosmic consciousness. He's not just a ball of energy. 
He's not the great white light. He's the infinite, personal, living God of the universe. But he's personal. The true God of the universe is a personal God. And that's why he repeatedly notices personal things. And God describes his very essence as love. So he creates a helper for Adam, whose name is Eve. And the purpose of Eve was to be a helper to the man. No, 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 she's not a second-class citizen. That, that's, we can study that and, and teach that later, but there's, that is not even remotely what the Bible says, because when you read the book of uh, the, book, the, the New Testament, you see that um, the man must be the servant to the wife as Christ is to the church. So there's so many checks and balances on a man dominating Uh, or exploiting a woman. God won't allow a man to do that. There's too many checks and balances. Now, um, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The deepest intimacy, the deepest intimacy spiritually, physically, psychologically, is the two becoming one flesh in a husband and wife relationship. The two shall become one. It's a sacred mystery, which the Apostle Paul says speaks to the mystery of Christ becoming one with his church. There's something very profound here, and it has everything to do with the personal nature of the personal living God of the universe. So, they enjoyed... Um, the Garden of Eden together. Now notice what happen, happens when they disobey God and they eat of the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. The first thing that's interrupted, well, first of all, they, they lost their innocence. They activated the law of sin and death. And then in chapter 3 in Genesis, it said, verse 8, They knew they were naked. They never knew they were naked before. They made themselves fig leaves as coverings. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said to the woman, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And then we see the the, the judgment of God that happens after this. But notice this. Notice this. God, on a regular basis, had a deep, intimate, personal one-on-one relationship with Adam and Eve. God was so personal with Adam and Eve before the fall that every day the Lord God would walk in the garden in the cool of the day and he would talk with Adam and Eve. He would communicate with Adam and Eve. He would befriend Adam and Eve. They had a very, very deep, intimate, close friendship where God actually would walk with them and talk with them um, during the cool of the day in Eden. And so this was his habit. God wasn't walking there to spy on them. Obviously, he knew what happened before it happened. He knew what was going to happen before it happened. But God, who made the habit of walking in the garden so he could hang out and befriend Adam and Eve did the same thing this day, and he discovered that they had sinned. Now, what they should have done, they should have trusted in God's love and God's relationship. They shouldn't have tried to hide from God what they had done with the fig leaves. Then they wouldn't have, see, they were afraid because they knew that they broke God's commandment, and they were naked, and they were frightened. But Had they turned to God at that moment 
asking God for forgiveness, coming to God, I don't know how the story would have turned out, but it may have turned out differently. Because ultimately, it's sin and rebellion that causes a separation, a wall, and a barrier between God and man to be erected. The wall of sin, the wall of rebellion, which can be dissolved when men and women come to God, repent of their sins, ask God for forgiveness of their sins, ask to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and ask God to restore that oneness and that intimacy which God is willing to do in Christ because Christ has taken our sin upon himself on the cross. So this is all about this intimacy, this oneship, this friendship that God has with man. See, no other religion even remotely touches on this. Do you understand that? I mean, this is so profound. This is so heavy. This is so, <clears throat> the magnitude of this is so stunning. It exposes every other religion and every other belief system ever conceived by man as a cruel imposter to the truth. The truth that God is the personal living God of the universe, who, who although he's the God of the universe, he wants an intimate companionship. He wants to be best friends, if you will, with each one of us. That is so deep, that is so personal, that is so intimate, that there's no words to describe it. And what it does is the beauty of it, the endless, infinite love that that truth contains, exposes all the other religions and belief systems as completely fraudulent. For example, the, the biblical account of Adam and Eve being created by God and the intense personal relationship that they had with one another exposes as scandalous and as man-made, as counterfeit, it exposes the theory of evolution, which is the exact opposite in its message. The theory of evolution says there's no meaning to life. Mankind randomly evolved over 500 million years from some molecular structure in a puddle, and then over 500 million years he evolved through might makes right into, you know, a man. And there's no personal God of the universe. There's no intimacy. There's no love. There's no friendship. There's no closeness. There's no dignity. Man is just an evolved animal. He's just like an artificially intelligent machine that's soulless. Do you see how, how empty, ugly, and hollow that is compared to the truth of Scripture? The truth of Scripture reveals itself as truth on multiple levels. Christians um, uh, become ineffective in communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ is because they fixate on one or two levels of communication, which are important. I'm not saying they're not important, but they get, for example, they get into a micro-focus mode, proving genetically that evolution is impossible. And it's necessary to do that because you have to fight the battle on a scientific level and a spiritual level. So it's necessary that apologists do that. D Darwinian evolution has to be defeated on a scientific level. There's no question about that. But Darwinian evolution also has to be defeated on the level of art, creativity, humanity, personality, and psychology, and love. And by that, I mean that the Darwinian evolutionary viewpoint is a cold, detached, dysfunctional universe in creation. It's a monstrosity. It's a Frankenstein that man has created for himself. Whereas the creation account, there's a beauty, there's a nobility in it, there's a transcendence in it that communicates that it's true. Not only is it true scientifically, but it's true on every area of life, including the psychological nature of man, the soul level of man, the intellect, the heart, and the emotions of man. And 
as such, the message of the Bible, ultimately, at its core, the message of the Bible is a message that resonates with eternal and unending joy. And the message of the Bible, ultimately, is a message that uh, radiates unending and eternal light that can never be extinguished. You see, the beauty of the Bible is multidimensional in nature. And so in every construct of reality, if we're talking about electromagnetic vibrations that create reality, as Einstein was talking about and other physicists, the vibrational level of truth is a distinct vibrational mode just like other things represent a distinct vibrational mode. And the love of God and the account of the love of God, there is nothing in human history, there's no fable, there's no mystical story, there's no Greek mythology, there's nothing that compares to the majesty, the beauty, the awesome wonder of God and his word. And it all revolves, the beauty of it all revolves around the fact that God is the infinite personal living God of the universe. He's personal. He's personal. And you see, every man and woman alive is created with this desperate emptiness inside of them, this God-shaped void inside of them that can't be explained on, on merely biological terms or psychological terms. It's, it's a God-shaped vacuum that can only be explained by spiritual terms. So in Genesis 1, when God says in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then it says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves in the earth. Here we see that God creates man in his own image. He creates them, male and female. He blesses them. Now notice the difference between that the difference between the infinite personal living God of the universe who is love. And you contrast that, those verses with the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 12 and 13, where it talks about the two beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and how they're depersonal. There's no personal relationship between the Antichrist and the people. It's a brutal, cruel slave system, devoid of personhood, devoid of love. That's why it's a fake Christ. And he must, the Antichrist, must kill people in order to get the allegiance of people to worship him. And we read in Revelation, this, this, this satanic system of Babylon, which is the opposite of the kingdom of heaven, is a brutal, soulless, cruel system. God is not in it. And the Antichrist, the people will worship the image of a beast. That means they're not going to even worship the Antichrist. It will be a soulless worship. It will be a hollow worship. It will be some kind of virtual reality, transhumanist worship that most likely will involve genetic engineering, perhaps the creation of a clone body, an android, a cyborg, our artificial intelligence. But all of that, you see, all of the stuff that man creates, it's very interesting. The virtual reality, the cyborgs, the artificial intelligence, the, the robots, all that stuff, it's all empty. It's all hollow. It's all soulless. It's all devoid of love. It cannot dare make the claim that it's the personal living God of the universe. There's no beauty in it. There's no grace in it. There's no, there's no joy in it. It's simply barbaric, soulless domination. You see the difference? You see the difference how one path sets you free? 
One path completes you, and one path is like a vampire. It sucks the blood out of you and lets your corpse rot in the sun and die. The path is so clear, man. The path is so clear. And all we have to do is really get out of the way of the clarity of God's path. Get out of the way so people can see it. And by get out of the way, I mean quit shoving religion down their throats. Just get out of the way and let them be exposed to the truth, the beauty, the majesty, the awesome wonder of God. And they will fall by the millions on their knees to Jesus Christ in their private moments. They will cry out to God. Why? Because the love of God is so deep that when people who act tough and have these mean exteriors, but in the secret privacy of their own private hells that they reveal to no one, but believe me, from the very top of the economic ladder to the very lowest part of the economic ladder. This world is packed with people living in their own private secret hells. And in that own private secret hell, they're crying out to God. And if we would get out of the way and allow the love of God to embrace them and the love of God to touch them, this personal love, they will be saved. They will be redeemed. Not all of them. Some are destined for hell. But many of them will be saved. Many of them will be redeemed. So now we need to do this now because the harvest time is here. And that's what Jesus said. The fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are few. You can join me. We are right now bringing in the harvest. It won't be all that long till the personal living God of the universe returns. But right now we bring in the harvest. And you can do that by being an intercessory prayer partner and continuing to pray for me, the ministry, my family. You can do that by using your gifts and talents to help us spread the message. And you can do that through your financial contributions and offerings so that we, we're ready to ramp up a whole new stage in television production, by the way. And I want to invite you to the Thursday, October 25th, Paradise Mountain Church meeting at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, 6 p.m. sharp. The meeting is free. Parking's free, but you must pre-register at paulmcguire.us. And I'm going to be talking about prayer and prophecy. It'll be a powerful time in the Lord, and I look forward to seeing you there. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Oh, by the way, before I forget, act on love and spread this message far and wide. Acquire and